the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth chapter from there in. Oh, my. Have your pencil and paper and everything ready. Or I believe the Lord is going to give us a great time. Now where Paul is exalting and placing positionally the Lord Jesus. Now if we get through this tonight, Sunday morning, which the most of this is going to blend right in with Sunday morning's message because it's separating the Sabbath. That's a great question amongst Sabbatarians today. And I would invite you all to come for Sunday morning for which is right, Saturday or Sunday for worship. What does the Bible say about it? And um, so then, uh, whether the, uh, the, this book is separating law and grace and is placing each one to its place. The Hebrews was raised by the law, and Paul was telling them what grace played with law. Amen. Now, uh, let's get just a little background now. We're going to start back. By the way, I got me some reading glasses. Maybe I can, if I happen to make a, a spill tonight, I got them. You know, I'm all, I just like two years and being 50 years old. And I don't see like I used to close to me. On my sight, I began to notice the words blurring. I thought I was going blind. I went for an examination. The doctor said, no, you're just past 40, son. <laughs> Well, he said, if I live be old enough, it might come back again, get that short sight back again. He said, now, you can read your Bible if you push it out from me. I said, yes. So after a while, your arm's not going to be long enough. <laughs> and so I, I hope now in this studying, that uh, this little Collins Bible has a good-sized print in it. I can make it out pretty well. But when we get over to big, deep places where we got to take the New and Old Testament and blend it together, I got a small Schofield, and uh, I'm used to the Schofield Bible, its markings. I don't read the Schofield notes now because I don't agree with Schofield on many of his, the, uh, the, uh, his theories, but I, I do like the way it's set up because it's, I've had it for a long time and read it and so much I uh, kind of know how to find my subject. This is all new to me, uh, teaching, and I'm not much of a teacher, but... You put up with me for a little while. I'll tell you the truth as far as I know it anyhow. Yeah. Now, this book is Paul. You remember he was, how did we find him? He was a great teacher to begin with, or a great scholar. And he was trained in the Old Testament. Can anybody tell me now who he found his teacher was? Gramalia, one of the noted teachers of the day. And then Paul, we find out one day... Before he was called Paul, can anybody tell me what his name was? Saul. Saul. And he was a great authority in Jerusalem, a religious authority. And he come up as a, as a real trained religious man. He could speak four or five different languages and a very smart man. Well, did his education and smartness help him? No, he said he had to forget all he knew in order to learn Christ. So we find out then it doesn't take a smart man or an educated man. It takes a, a man that's willing to humble himself before God, regardless of how. Did you know Dwight Moody was, was so uneducated to honest? His writings were poor as I don't know what. They had to fix up his messages all the time. He, uh, he was such a poor writer, very uneducated. Do you know that Peter and John of the Bible were so unlearned till they couldn't even write their own name and wouldn't know it laying before them? The apostle Peter, who had the keys to the kingdom, wouldn't know his name signed before him. Think of it. The Bible said that he was ignorant and unlearned. Amen. So that gives me a chance. <laughs> Amen. Yes, sir. That goes right on down to find that God could do that to a man. Now, and we find out as soon as Paul had a great experience, I want to ask you, is it an experience to come to Christ? Does everybody have an experience? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a birth. It's an experience. And so we were in a Lutheran college not long ago. I had the privilege this afternoon, late, supposed to be there at 12 o'clock for dinner with with. 
Tom Hare, how many ever heard of him? The famous Irish uh, prayer warrior. And he's been with this brother Epp on his program and appeared here in many places in America. And I had dinner with him today and we were uh, just about three hours late. It's about 3.30, 4 to 4 when we eat, but it was all right. And we were discussing all these things of how that Jesus Christ is the head of all things. Now, when Paul found this out, he had this experience, and then before he would accept this experience, it must be back to the Bible. And we find out that he, that he left and went into another nation, and there he stayed for three years searching the Scripture to see if his experience was right. Now, we realize that he had a great thing to face. He had to come back and tell his church and all the people the very things that he had persecuted was right. Did you have to do something like that? Yeah. Certainly, yeah. nearly all of them. Have to go back and say, them people that we call holy rulers, come to find out they were right. Yeah. See? That's it. We just had to turn around and the things that we once hated, we now love. It's a conversion, a strange thing. Ah, I made that statement of a holy roller. There is no such a thing. There's no such a thing. But they call people that holiness people. But there's no holy rollers. There's no such a thing. There's no record of any church ever recorded like that. As far as I can see, of the 960-something different denominations, there is no such a denomination as holy roller. It's just a, a name that the devil tacked on the church. But they call them in that day. How many knows what they call them in the day of Paul? Heretics. You know what heretic means? Crazy. It's crazy people. So I'd just soon be called a holy roller as a heretic, wouldn't you? So if they, um, if they was called that and rejoiced, then what did Jesus say for us to do about it? He said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets before you. They did it. That to be exceedingly glad, anything exceedingly is lifted way up, real happy. And the disciples, when they were found worthy to bear the reproach of the name of Jesus, they rejoiced with great joy that they could bear the reproach of his name. And the day, many people today, if they'd have to call him the Holy Roller, they'd cow down. My, maybe I was wrong to begin with. But they was happy about it. Oh, my. Amen. To bear the name. And now in the second century, they called them crossbacks. And that's when the Christians used to pack a cross on their back to show, show that they were crucified with Christ. They called them crossbacks. Now, I know the Catholic calls themselves that, but that wasn't the Catholic Church. It was the Protestant Church before it was called Protestant Church. It protested nothing but sin. The reason it's called Protestant Church today is because it protested the, the Catholic dogma. But it's, um, it's still, it was non-sectarian at that time when they were called crossback. Just get the history of Josephus and the other writers and Hossus II Babylons and so forth, and you'll find out that that's right. That there was not no church. The first organized church ever was was the Catholic Church about 300 years after the round of the, of the last apostles. About 300 years later, the Catholic Church was organized and a persecution set in and forced the people into the Catholic Church. And um, they had church and state united. That was after what was so-called the conversion of Constantine from paganism to Catholicism. But if anybody ever read his history, he wasn't converted to the things that he did. Oh, my. The only thing he ever done religious was put the cross on the St. Sophia Church. That's the only thing he ever done acted even religious. He was a, a reprobate. But they call it his, his conversion. This about compares with some so-called conversions today. Now, but we find out when Paul got converted and had this real experience, he was absolutely turned around. And you know conversion means to be turned around? You're going this way and you turn and start back this way. Amen. Yes, sir, it's a turn around about face. And 
Paul, as soon as he was converted, before he could ever make his experience, now he had a marvelous experience. Now I believe when you accept Christ, just as your personal Savior, it is an experience. I believe the joy of knowing your sins forgiven just thrilled your heart through and through. But then when the blessed Holy Spirit comes down, that's an experience, that new birth that you'll never forget. You become a child of God. Here's what does it. How do you know it, Brother Branham? Now, these are teaching lessons. Many people, the Methodists try to say, they shouted when they got it. Well, that's all right. If you got it and shouted, okay. Because you shouted, it wasn't a sign you had it. Because a lot shouted and didn't have it. The Pentecostal said, they spoke in tongues, they got it. That's all right. If you spoke in tongues and got it, all right. But you could speak in tongues and still not have it. So, so you see, after all, it is the experience of passing from death to life. When all the old things die and all things become new, Christ becomes real. The old things drop away. The old roots of carnality. You know how to dig a root out? We used to take a grubbing hole and just get down at it and dig it till there wasn't a speck left in it. And they said, if there be any root of bitterness spring up in you, grub her out. That's right. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. Root. Out all the roots, dig them out, pile them up, burn them, get rid of them. You get a good crop then, <laughs> if we do that. Now, Paul knows that something happened, so he goes back down into uh, Arabia, and there he studies for three years on all of the Old Testament prophets, how they prophesied, and he come to find out that it was absolutely the truth. Now, compare that with today. See, on this experience that we had here at this little church, of the morning star appearing under, that great light that come down that would foretell and show things to happen. You know, that's marvelous. But my minister and brother told me it was of the devil. And I, I couldn't understand it. So I didn't say nothing about it until one night there was an experience happened. Up down in Greensville, Indiana, when the angel of the Lord walked across the floor and stood there and proved it by the Scripture, then it set fire, then it started going. No longer than last Sunday, we've seen the infallible marks of Jesus Christ, who can take a man that hasn't walked and get in a balanced nerve bone when the males, the best doctor said it's finished forever, and setting blind. Raise up and walk out of the building pushing his wheelchair. Down the steps could walk and see like anybody else. That shows that it's the power of the resurrected Lord Jesus. There it is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So aren't we a happy group tonight to know that God has vindicated this great experience that we have to be compared with his Bible and with the promise? Therefore, we ought to be exceedingly glad. And we realize that in the second chapter we find out we should not let these things, uh, we should not neglect these things. We should hold fast those things. And how are we going to escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Amen. What are we going to do in the light of God's Word when we stand at the judgment bar? Wow. You can't say, I never knew any different. Oh, yes, you did. Well, now, Brother Branham could have been wrong. That's true. But God isn't wrong. His Word isn't wrong. And just think of the same thing, the Bible, that once lived in the apostles are living again. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. When I think that I'm 48 years old, nearing 50, and my youthful days are gone, and so forth, to know that since a little boy that I've had this blessed promise and have declared it to my brothers and sisters and to see the literally thousands of those that's come out of darkness, to know that we're going to our eternal home to the blessed and if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved before I get to preaching, there's one waiting under for us. Hallelujah. To know that there's 
dozens of people sitting here that if they should leave this life right now, before we could get their body to the undertaker, they would be in that glorious body yonder, rejoicing with the saints of God, already in the presence of God to live forever with the perfect, absolutely vindication that it's so. Amen. Amen. Oh, that would make the Presbyterian shout. Did some did it? Them people were Presbyterian. Certainly would. The saints. Oh, no wonder people get emotionally. Why, if you get emotionally from batting a ball or throwing one in a basket, how much more will it make you emotionally to know that you've passed from death to life? That you're a new creation in Christ. You know it by the way your spirit leads you. Amen. Away from malice and guile and enmity and all the things of the world and your heart set centered on Christ. Amen. That's your motives. That's all that you think of. In your mind, on your heart, all day and night. When you go to bed at night, put your hands behind you like this and just lay there and praise Him until you go to sleep. Amen. Wake up in the morning still praising Him. Amen. Oh, my. I've tried to praise Him of the morning. We've been getting up about 4 o'clock, Brother Woods and I, going out early in the morning to go squirrel hunting. I've praised Him under every tree I believe I'll come to. Amen. I can't see a tree without praising Him. Amen. Think He grows that tree. Amen. Still a little grasshopper fly up. He knows that grasshopper. Oh, you say nonsense, Brother Bill. Oh, no, it isn't. He knows where every squirrel is. He knows where every butterfly is. Why, at one time, he needed some money and said, Peter, there's a fish who ought to go swallow the coin. This is not much that we need. Go cast the hook in. I sent him over there. Take that coin out of his mouth because he can't use it himself. Go pay him our time and contribute. Amen. Amen. And a few weeks ago, I seen a little fish kill laying on the water. All of you heard the story of it. There's Brother Woods and his brother and I'm here to witness it. That little fish laying dead for a half hour on the water with his entrails pulled out of its mouth. And the great Holy Spirit swept down after he said the day before, you're going to see the resurrection of a little animal. And the next morning, about a little after sunup, we saw that little fishy. Not over that long. When the Spirit of the Lord came down and said, little fish. Jesus Christ makes you whole. And that dead fish had been floating on top of the water for practically a half hour, come to life and swam away just as hard as he could. Amen. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. How wonderful he is. No wonder Paul could say that he was in the order of Melchizedek. He was Melchizedek. Melchizedek had no beginning of days. He had no ending of years. He had no beginning of life or ending of life. He had neither father nor mother. So it couldn't be no one else. Ever who he was, he's alive yet tonight. Amen. So he is only one type of eternal life, and that belongs to God. Last evening when we were having a discussion, a brother could not understand the Trinity of God and how we were talking about it. How that Jesus stood there, a man of about uh, 30 years old. And he said, they said, oh, our fathers eat man in the wilderness. He said, and they're everyone dead. But he said, I'm that bread of life that come from God out of heaven that a man eats and don't die. Amen. Oh, he said, our fathers drink from the rock in the wilderness. He said, I'm that rock. <laughs> a man of 30 years old. Said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Well, I said, now you mean to tell me that you're as old as Abraham and you're not 50 years old yet? I mean to say that you've seen Abraham who's been dead 800 years? We know that you got a devil now. You're crazy. That's what, that's what a devil means. Crazy person. Said, you got a devil and you're mad. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. That's who he was. He wasn't just merely a man, neither was he a prophet. He was God. God dwelling on earth in a body of flesh called Jesus, the, the incarnate Son of God. That's exactly who he was. Now, we find him over here 
that in the last part now of the closing of the second chapter, which I wanted to get to, beginning with the 16th verse, or the 15th verse, and delivered them through the fear of death, of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's what he said that Jesus did. That he come to deliver them from bondage who had been in fear of death all their lifetime. Now, there's no need of fearing death. Now, of course, we do. Uh, we None of us want to what we call die. But do you know that if a person is born again, he cannot die? How can he have eternal life and then die? He can't do it. The only thing is death. The word death means the separation. Now he'll separate from the presence of our eyes. But he's always in the presence of God. And always will be. So death isn't a hard thing. Death is a glorious thing. Death is what takes us in the presence of God. But now, of course, we being human, walking in these dark elements here, we, we do not understand it as we should. And, of course, when the choking pains of death come, it makes the very saintest of us fear and draw back. It made the Son of God say, could this cup pass? It's a horrible thing. Don't get it wrong. Because we, it's a penalty of sin, death is. And it's got to be horrible. But if we can look just beyond the curtain yonder, there's where it's at. That's it. Be the Lord. Just beyond the curtain. That's where man desires to look tonight. Little Lana Mae Snelling, and them used to sing a song here, Lord, let me look past the curtain of time. Everybody wants to see that. Now, now here we are in the 16th verse. For verily he took for verily he took not on him, upon him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Oh, we want to hold to that again now. Huh? Now we're coming right down to get, because the first part of this third chapter, the last part of it blends in on that day for the Sabbath for this coming Sunday. Now what? He took not the nature of angels. I uh, who's he he's talking about. Christ. Who's Christ? God. The Logos of God. Now let me explain this again so you be sure. God is not three gods. The Trinity of God is one. Father, Son, Holy Ghost doesn't mean that there is three different gods. If it is, we'd be heathen. That's the reason the Jews can't understand Never was it taught in the Bible. Now, it's taught in the Catholic Church. Absolutely. That's where the triune baptism comes from. In Africa, they baptize you three times face forward. Once for God the Father. Once for God the Son. Once for God the Holy Ghost. Now, that's an error. There's no such teaching to that in the Bible. See? And now, that's, that's what they taught. It come down to Luther, out of Luther into Wesley, on down into the ages as it rolls on. But it never was a Bible teaching. It has always been an error since it would begin. Now, so God was in the beginning before there was any light, before there was ever an atom, before there was ever a star, before there was any visible thing, God filled all space. And in that was nothing but purity, pure love, pure holiness, pure righteous. It was spirit. He covered the whole space uh, from eternity where we can't fathom it. It goes beyond anything that we could imagine. Like through that glass, we could see a, a hundred and something million years of light space. Think of it. A hundred million years of light space. And light, light travels about 8,000 miles per second. And a hundred and million years of light space. Just think how many miles that would be. You couldn't even numerate it. 
You can just take a row of nines and run it around Jeffersonville and still you wouldn't have it broke down in miles. A mile, think of it. And beyond that is still stars and planets. And God, before one of them was, He was. See? And now the Logos that went out of God, which was the, the Logos, all this began to form into a, a body shape. And this body shape was called, in the scholars' teaching, Logos. The Logos that went out of God. In other words, a, a better word for it was a, what we call a theostomy. Theostomy is a human body that's glorified. Not exactly with flesh and blood like it will be in its glorified stage, but it is a, the form of a human body that doesn't eat, neither does it drink, but it's, it's a body, a body that's waiting for us as soon as we leave this one. Now, in there, we enter into that body, and that's the kind of body that God was. For he said, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. Now, when man become into that body, he had control of all the fishes and fowls and and beasts of the field, and then there was no man to till the soil. Genesis 2. He done made male and female, but there's no man to till the soil. Then God made man out of the dust of the earth. He give him a hand like a like a chimpanzee. He give him a foot like a bear. He give him he made him on the image, and this earthly body is in the image of animal life. And it's made out of the same kind of material. Your body's made just the same kind of material as a horse or a dog or anything like that. It's made out of calcium, potash, petroleum, cosmic light. You're just no all flesh like that is not the same flesh. It's different flesh, but it's made out of the dust of the earth. Where'd it come from? But the difference between an animal and a man, God put a soul in a man. And he didn't put it in the animal. Because the soul that was in the man is that theostomy. Oh, I'll, I'll never get to the, this lesson, but I've got to get this. Look, don't you remember when Peter was in prison and the angel of the Lord came and opened the doors? We was going through the supermarket up here the other day and the door opened in front of us. I said, you know, the Bible had that first. <laughs> See? Now, the swinging doors by itself. And when Peter came out, walking by these guards, they were blinded to him. He passed the inner guard, the outer guard, out into the court, through the wall, out into the street. And none of them know who he was. And didn't pay, they thought he was another guard or something. They, he just passed by, and the door opened by itself as he went out and shut behind and when he got out there, he thought he had a dream. And he went out to John Mark's house where they had a prayer meeting. And he was not to be among them. Oh, he's glorious. He's wonderful. Now, oh, he wasn't made in the form of an angel. But he took on the seed of Abraham. God became the seed of Abraham. Now, if we had time to go back and show how he did it in the covenant, you've heard me preach on it many times, how that he took those animals and cut them apart and throw the turtle dove and pigeon in. And then he looked and he noticed a little smoke of black heart, death, next to smoke and furnace, hell. But beyond that went a little white light. And that little white went between each piece of that cut sacrifice, showing that what he would do. And he took an oath when he did that, and he wrote a covenant. Showing what he would do. And he, Jesus Christ come to the earth. God, Emmanuel. God in flesh. And at Calvary, he was torn apart. And his spirit come back on the church. And his body was lifted up and set on the throne of God. The throne of God. The one that's on the throne is the judge. We know that. Well, where is the judgment? The Father has given... He, Judge no man, but the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. So He is, and His 
Life is the high priest sitting there with his own body as a sacrifice to plead our confessions. Amen, Amen brother. That puts something in you. Notice, he took on the seed of Abraham. He became a man. God made flesh among us to redeem us. In other words, God became sin that we sinners might become partakers of Him. And when we partake of Him, we partake of these. We were time space people, three score and ten. And God came down and become one of us three score and ten for His lot of time that we might partake of His eternal life. And when we're born again, we're sons and daughters of God and have eternal life and shall never perish. Oh, what a, what a, what a blessed Savior. Oh, there's no way to write it. There's no way to explain it. It's just beyond explaining. No one can explain how great it is. How great thou art, how great thou art. is right. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Think of that. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Listen to this. To make reconciliations, the sins of the people. To reconcile. Now, God, knowing justice, had to become unjustice to feel what it was to be a sinner, to go back to reconcile, to reconciliation, and have mercy on the people. Next verse, listen now here. For in that he himself had suffered, God could not suffer in spirit. He had to become flesh to feel the pain of sickness, to feel the temptation of lust, to feel the temptation of want, to feel the temptation of hunger, to feel the power of death, that he might take it upon himself to stand in the presence of the great Spirit, Jehovah, the Spirit, not the man, the Spirit, to make intercessions to this life. And Jesus took that in order to make intercessions for us, for He knows how it feels. Amen. Amen. When you get sick, He knows how you feel. Amen. When you're tempted, He knows how you feel. Now, did you ever notice when we vote for a president, every farmer will vote for a president that's been a farmer. For he knows the hard part of the farmer's life. See? He wants some man who understands. And before God could ever understand him being that great holiness, how he could ever understand after he condemned man by his holiness, he condemned man, and the only way he'll ever know how to justify man is to become man. Amen. And God overshadowed the virgin, and she brought forth a body, not Jewish blood, not Gentile blood, but His own blood, God's creative blood. No sex at all in it at all. No sexual desire. And this blood cell created in the womb of this woman brought forth the Son, and when He was baptized by John the Baptist, John said, I bear record, seeing the Spirit of God like a dove a coming down and abiding upon Him. No wonder Jesus could say that all powers in heaven and earth is given into my hand. God and man became one. Heavens and earth embraced each other, and He was the one who could give reconciliations for our sins. Amen. That's the reason that in His name healing takes place. He knows your pain. Did you ever hear this little old song? Jesus knows the pain you feel. He can save and 
He can heal. Amen. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. That's right. He knows when our bodies rack with pain and our health we can't regain. Just remember God in heaven answers prayer. Jesus knows the pain you feel. He can save and he can heal. Just take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. That's all he asks. Just leave it there. Why? He's a high priest standing here that knows how you feel. And he knows how to reconcile you back to grace and how to bring you back to your health. He knows all about it. He yeah. suffered. When you haven't got a place to lay your head, he had the same. When you've got one change of clothes, he had the same. When you were made fun of, persecuted, he had the same. Yeah. Listen to the last verse now. All right. He is able to succor those that are tempted. Or in other words, he is able to secure those, to help those. To make those, to sympathize with them. Because God himself became man in order to feel it. You remember the other night that we teach on that? How that God had, uh, death had a sting in it, a scar in it. All their days they were in bondage about this death. And then Jesus came that he might take that stinger out of death. And when he was going up the mountain... Remember how we illustrated it? Them little red dots on his coat, and after a while they all become one big dot and splashing the blood around him. His little frail body, he couldn't go any farther in. He fell. Simon, serene, the colored man, helped him bear the cross on up the hill. And when they nailed him to the cross, and he screamed for water, any man bleeding needs water. Remember when I preached the other night on the deer and the heart? Thirst for the water brook, so my soul paineth after thee, O God. If the deer's wounded and living, losing blood, he's got to get the water or he'll die. I was shot down in the field when I was 14 years old. And I was laying there, my legs blowed over me like a hamburger from a 12-gauge shotgun. And I screamed for water. Oh, give me a drink. I numb my lips as down. My buddy ran over to an old pool, had all kinds of little wiggle tails swamp. I didn't care what it was. And he raked it full of water. And I held my mouth open and he squeezed his cap out like that in my mouth. You had to have water. He was bleeding. He said, give me a drink. And they give him vinegar on a sponge. And he rejected it. And refused it. He was God's lamb dying in our stead to bring reconciliation to the human being. What was it? The God of heaven. Amen. Billy Sunday once said that every bush had angels sitting in it saying, just pull your hand loose and point your finger. We'll change the situation. That sassy bunch of religious fanatics called some big educated scholars of DD, PhDs, Walked by him and said, Now, if you are the Son of God, you saved others yourself, you can't save. Come down off the cross and we'll believe you. They didn't know that they was paying him a compliment. He could have saved himself. But if he saved himself, others he could not save. So he gave himself. Blessed be his name. He gave himself that I could be saved and you could be saved. Oh, what matchless love. He didn't have to be sick, that precious virgin-born body. Didn't have to be sick. But he became sick that he might know how to intercede for me when I was sick. He didn't have to weary, but he did weary. I read a little history one time on it. I don't know whether it's authentic or not. When he raised that boy from then there, all from the dead, he sat on a rock and groaned with a headache. Because he had to bear our sickness. He had to bear our sins. And there he died. And on Calvary, 
When that old bee and death once anchored its stinger, anyone knows when a bee anchors its stinger, it can't sting no more. When the bee flies away or any insect that stings, when he anchors his stinger, he pulls the stinger out. He's still a bee, but he hasn't got a stinger. The only thing you can do is buzz and make a lot of noise. That's the only thing that death can do to the believer, is make a lot of noise. But hallelujah, blessed be the name of the Lord. He anchored that stinger of death in his own flesh. Emmanuel did it. Rose up again on the third day, shot the stinger out of there. And the mortal tonight, and his spirit is in this building. And he proves himself alive among us. That's our Messiah. That's our blessed Savior. 